Hello, AP World Historians. Hope you're all doing well. Uh, good to see and talk to everybody out there. We're taking a look here at Unit 1.3, which is South and Southeast Asia. Um, we're still in Time Period 1, which is 1200 to 1450. Uh, before we move on with this a little bit, just a little bit of background on this and sort of what it means and where we are, and a little bit of context before we get to this point. So South Asia is going to generally be considered the... Um, the Indian subcontinent, uh, we might know it as. Um, so it would include modern day countries like Pakistan or India or Bangladesh, uh, places like that. Um, so it's anywhere basically from um, the south of the Himalayas in that area, um, because it's south of Asia, it's the south part of Asia. Southeast Asia then will typically consist of the islands for, the in, for Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, um, Thailand, that general area. Um, and they're, they are related to each other through trade. They have some trade contacts and religion contracts and contacts and cultural contacts, uh, but they're not as connected and they have slightly different histories depending on what time period we're talking about here. So let's start off with South Asia then. And I want to mention something just about South Asian history sort of in general. Um, unlike uh, certain other places, like if we think of uh, China, when we think of China and when Chinese think of China too, they consider the unification of China to be the standard as opposed, or the norm, as opposed to the periods of warrings, warring states kind of things that are happening. So throughout Chinese history, we have these moments where China sort of falls apart and everything is broken up. But there's an expectation basically from, I mean, really the Song Dynasty, maybe even the Tang Dynasty onward, that eventually it's all going to get back together. It's just going to take a little bit of time. Um, in South Asia, then, uh, the Indian subcontinent, that's not really the case. In fact, it's almost the reverse of that. The periods of unity in South uh, Asia are going to be the exceptions to the rule. So what we have initially is we have the uh, Harappan or Indus River Valley civilization that's located on the Indus River in northern India. Um, when we have these uh, group of people called the Aryan invaders are going to come, they're going to occupy that area. Um, when they do so, then they're going to set themselves up on this sort of higher level or higher standard, but then they're going to break themselves up into little kind of kingdoms and principalities and things. Uh, the political philosophies of the Aryans were not really geared towards sort of empire-wide kind of things there. So what you have then is you have a, a period of unification under the Indus River Valley civilization. Then we have this period of the Aryans, which is where everything's kind of broken up. And that's where it's going to stay for a very long period of time. Um, until we start having these sort of unifications through things like the Delhi Sultanate or we eventually will have the Mughals and then under Britain and then under modern day India, um, we'll see those things, but they are sort of the exception in a sense, not the rule. The, the rule generally for India is that it is fairly fragmented into smaller little kingdoms and principalities, uh, whereas uh, that would not be the case in certain other places around the world. All right, uh, let's take a look here at a couple of things for us to know about South and Southeast Asia. So starting us off here, uh, in addition to the southern Hindu empires, in the north of India, the Rajput kingdoms were a group of squabbling, squabbling excuse me, small political groups. Um, so what happens then, we have a few of these uh, southern empires, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, but in addition to those, then, we also have this northern area. And the problem then is that they are being repeatedly assaulted by Muslims. Um, the Muslims are coming from the Middle East. They're looking to expand their territories. Uh, we have various um, conquerors and other groups that are trying to come in and take over control. Um, and generally speaking, these Rajput kingdoms are able to resist. Uh, in a large way. Um, we do have a couple of examples where we're going to have a few people who are able to set up sort of small kingdoms or places, uh, but they're not as big or as important as we'll see. So what happens then is that the Delhi Sultanate will eventually take control. Um, so we have a group of uh, Muslim leaders who are going to come into the north of India. They're going to conquer the current uh, areas there, and they will set up uh, this new empire, this new sultanate in the north part of India. Um, this sultanate will be around for about 300 years. It kind of goes through a lot of changes, ups and downs, bigger, smaller, that kind of stuff. Uh, but generally speaking, it's going to be there for quite a while. And it will start the process then that we have uh, that leads to today where a sizable minority of people in the Indian subcontinent are Muslims. So in the modern day just country of India, for example, uh, I think 300, maybe 400 million people are Muslims there. Um, so that's that's the minority, which is a lot of people in India, but that is the minority there in that 
country, um, but it's still very, very sizable. So what happens then is that the Sultanate then is not going to actively try to convert a lot of people. It's not really their thing. I mean, they definitely did want to convert people. They were fine with it, but they also realized that there is a sizable, sizable group of, of Hindus there. So much like when um, Muslim forces conquered parts of the Middle East, they allowed the people there to remain with their same traditions. Um, we're going to see somewhat similar here. Like if they had just started like mass trying convert converting everyone, there would be an enormous amount of resistance and the uh, local peoples would not have been particularly happy about that. So instead, um, they are going to obviously allow for conversions, but they're not going to really try to upset or tick off a lot of the Hindus that were in that area. Um, so that Hinduism then will remain incredibly strong in that area. So we will have Hinduism for quite a long period of time. Um, Delhi was able to stop the Mongols from evading eventually, um, but eventually uh, they uh, they will fall to the Mughal eventually much later. So we'll get there later um, in uh, a while. Um, now, one of the things, the cultural kind of changes here that's going to happen is that we're going to see a number of people who do convert to Islam, and those are going to be people sort of on the outs in Hindu society. So, for example, Buddhists. So Buddhism, of course, is founded in northern India, um, but over the years it had suffered some highs and lows. Uh, so, for example, Hindus, you know, uh, wouldn't they were kind of out of the caste system in some ways. They didn't really know how to treat them all the time. Um, so Buddhism had, while still strong, had faded a bit by this time, um, and it had spread to other places, like in China and places. It was enormous at this time, uh, but uh, in India proper, it was sort of fading a bit. And also, low caste Hindus. These are going to be our early converts to Islam. Makes total sense, right? If you are on the outs of society as a Buddhist, or if you are on the low levels of Hindu society, then why wouldn't you convert? Like convert over to uh, the Muslim religion where you have some possibilities and other things uh, that are there for you. Um, what this does actually in the long run is it essentially eliminates Buddhism as a native thing in India. Um, most of the Buddhists who live in India today are uh, Tibetan Buddhists who have fled from China into, uh, into India. Now, um, what we'll see then is that as we're having some of this uh, conversion going on to Islam, there's a reaction amongst the Hindu religious leaders and amongst the Hindu faithful, the laity, um, which is that they start having this thing known as the Bhakti movement. So traditionally in Hinduism, you sort of follow whoever, like you have a general kind of perspective, you know, there's the Brahma and, um, and there's no real necessary, you don't have to focus in on sort of um, one of the deities or one of the avatars of the Brahma. So instead though, these Bhakti movements then are going to start to place a a lot of emphasis on doing that. So instead of sort of having a holistic perspective, oh, I can you know worship any of the Hindu gods or goddesses or, or none at all, you know, just in general worship. Uh, now we're going to see a big focus on one or two very important ones. So for example, Vishnu is going to be huge uh, in this thing. And so modern day Vaishnavism, which I'm probably mispronouncing, and apologies, uh, that is going to be an example of Hinduism where there's an emphasis on one particular deity, Vishnu. So we see this uh, today as well. Like this is the predominant... Um, religious strains within Hinduism is this movement towards these bhakti uh, movements towards like uh, focusing in on one god or one goddess to uh, to emphasize within your worship. Doesn't mean you're not worshiping the others too. I mean you would do that as well. It's just that you're placing it on one. So that is going to be an example of a resistance. If you know if the Mughals, excuse me, if the um, if the Muslims are going to emphasize Allah and one god then well you know we can have something similar here by emphasizing one of the avatars of the Brahma. Um, we're also going to see uh, that uh, we're going to have some similarities with the Sufis. Um, they are going to focus on more emotional arguments and attachment to specific gods as a part of this back deep movement. The Sufis, again, are going to be uh, Muslim missionaries. Uh, they are kind of a mystical group um, descended from the Shia or part of the Shia uh, movement. Um, and they are going to believe that, um, that, in a sense, human beings could see God within uh, our lifetimes. If we take a look here at a couple maps, you can get a kind of a good idea of sort of where the Sultan of Delhi is and what's going on. Um, so this this plane that we have up here, if you look at the colors up there under the Lodi dynasty, see how that kind of dark black up there is? Um, that general area there is just south of the Himalayas and it is uh, known as the Gangetic Plain because of the Ganges River that runs through it. Ganges River, very holy for Hinduism, um, but it also provides a lot of food, a lot of you know water for people who are living in that area. Very important, not only spiritually, but also uh, just in normal ways. Um, so what you can see then is that northern plain then is the place that everyone's going to uh, going to occupy. That's the place that these dynasties are going to be under control. Um, one thing about it too, you'll notice that the southern part of India, with the exception of that, um, I can't even pronounce that word, Tughluq dynasty, uh, with the exception of that dynasty of the of the Delhi Sultanate, then you're going to see that that southern part is difficult. That's primarily because of a um, 
of a geographic issue. The south part of India is very heavily, has a lot more like kind of jungle or, you know, uh, forest in it. Um, there's also a high plain, which makes it very difficult to, to occupy, to kind of attack into that area. So people down there were able to uh, more force, forcefully resist uh, those, those groups in the north as well. But you can see, again, um, they're going to be important in this period. They have a lot of different ones, and the, and the dynasties kind of stretch and grow depending on the time period. All right, continuing on here then, um, again, while there are some social changes, the power of the Hindu caste system prevented widespread changes from really happening. So, for example, uh, while low caste people did convert, they didn't end up getting better jobs. Like, just because you were a tanner uh, before and worked with sort of ritually polluting uh, kind of things and became an untouchable doesn't mean that you're going to be able to now all of a sudden uh, become the prime minister or something because uh, you have converted to Islam. Um, instead, uh, for the most part, most people who converted over were going to end up kind of in their same positions. Uh, Muslims were essentially able to fit into this hierarchy of Hinduism on the basis of occupation. And since most of the Muslims who were coming were high-level warriors or they were um, you know, religious leaders or whatever, they were generally going to be at the very top of the of the Hindu social hierarchy because, you know, if you're the sultan, then you're at the top and they will respect you in that sense. Now, one of the things that's really fascinating here is the uh, spread of Indian ideas and concepts that will uh, spread with the arrival of Islam. Uh, Islam, of course, has a lot of information. They are very um, scholarly during this period. Uh, we have the Abbasid Golden Age with all kinds of discoveries. Um, and Islamic scholars will add to their knowledge of math and astronomy for, with ideas from these Indian areas. There's obviously kind of a com combination back and forth as well. But the concept that we know today as Arabic numerals, which I'll show you a picture of in a second, originally came from India and were modified over time by the Islamic scholars. One of the things we'll see in South Asia as well as the in architecture, we're going to start to see a melding of Islamic and Hindu art. Um, so, for example, there is a structure called, um, again, apologies for pronunciation, Qutub Minar. Um, this was a mosque that was built on top of a former Hindu temple. Um, but when they built it, they used the existing kind of rock and like carvings and things to make that temple. So it was a combination. It was sort of a Hindu temple kind of looking or structure, um, but it's going to have uh, be a mosque and have Islamic influences as well. So in this period of the Delhi Sultanate, we'll start to see a lot of this blending of Islamic and Hindu art. Uh, and Hindu kind of cultural ideas and concepts as well. Um, here's an example of these things. So Brahmi, Hindi, Hindu, excuse me, Arabic, medieval to modern. Uh, we have the different levels of these different um, different scripts or these different numerals. Um, so you can sort of see where they're coming from in a lot of these. You can see sort of how they develop uh, over time. So uh, our one is descended from that initial um, structure up there, the nine and so forth. You can kind of see its evolution over time. Some of them are kind of weird. Like I don't know what was going on with uh, the Arabic eight there. <laughs> Not exactly the same, uh, but still you can see sort of how it all uh, comes down through the ages uh, until we end up with our modern numbers that we have down there at the bottom. All right, we're going to do a real quick hit here on South and Southeast Asia. Um, so again, we mentioned at the top here we have these different areas, but this area down here, this area of, um, of Southeast Asia, this is the area of Southeast Asia. Um, so we have modern day states like uh, Malaysia, we have uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, all these kind of places here um, in the modern day. And in this time period too, we have a lot of the same sort of cultures or ethnicities uh, that are in these regions. Uh, they are just sort of uh, in different places or controlling different areas and Step. Um, so, for example, um, you can see this big red area here is going to be our Khmer uh, Khmer Empire. Um, up here, then um, Sukhothai, which is going to end up becoming like modern day Thailand or Siam, Siam. Um, and then also over here, we can see this as well with these different uh, groupings of uh, Vietnamese uh, groupings as well. So, Vietnam sort of up here in the north initially. Um, and then a bunch of other little kind of states along the way as well. And all the way down here to the Majapahit Empire in the south. So, what we're going to see then is we are going to see that it is primarily changing religions due to traders coming from India. So we're initially going to have a lot of Hinduism and Buddhism that are going to become prominent. So for example, uh, the Khmer Empire was um, had a lot of influences from those things. Um, Vietnam is going to end up having a lot of Buddhism spread, as is Thailand as well. So we'll see a lot of these religions are coming to these areas. Eventually, we will say the same thing with Islam. We'll see a lot of that coming down into uh, modern-day Indonesia. We're also going to see a couple of sea-based kingdoms. So two particular ones here, Srivijaya and Majapahit. Um, if you look down here on the map, you'll see Majapa hit here. Uh, this is on the modern day island of Sumatra. Um, so this empire as well as the Srivijaya are going to protect this 
little trade route. So the thing about it is that if you want to go from India to China, the quickest route is through this little tiny place right here, which gave a lot of opportunity for this empire to basically uh, make money off of people coming through there, whether it's through taxes or whether it's charging people you know, things for it or just trading with people who are coming through, they could end up making a lot of money. So they are going to thrive in that period. Uh, we also have a few of these land-based kingdoms, as I pointed out a minute ago. Uh, Modern-day Sri Lanka um, and the Sinhala din dynasties were a Buddhist empire. That's actually off that map over um, Sri Lanka is the sort of like almost teardrop that's at the bottom of uh, India. Um, and then we will also see the Khmer Empire, which was a major force until it was invaded and conquered by the Sukhothai Empire and overthrown. Um, and that is going to be the predecessor of the modern-day Thai kingdom. So again, one of the biggest factors here for Southeast Asia is trade. Trade is huge through that area. Um, the movement of goods back and forth, but we're also going to see um, some land-based dynasties that are primarily based upon their ability to grow food. So uh, the Khmer Empire in particular had a lot of, um, of rice production techniques that allowed them to feed more people, feed more troops, and, and enable themselves to expand their holdings in Southeast Asia. All right, uh, that's all we got for today. Just a short little hit there on South and Southeast Asia. Um, I hope you uh, had some good information there for it, and I hope that helped you out a little bit. Um, and we'll see you next time when we take a look at the Americas. All right, thanks a lot. Bye-bye.